Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. God is full of instructions when it comes to worshiping Him. I've shared with you many times that we were created to worship God, to do so both in the spirit and according to the truth. And it's only when we have experienced salvation, as we talked about earlier in our call to worship, salvation positions us for blessing. Without a salvation experience, we ought not expect God's blessing to be upon us. And likewise, without a salvation experience, we ought not expect to be able to worship God. Salvation through redemption always, always positions us and gives us the ability to worship God. Well, we have been speaking about worship for the last several weeks. We've spoke about certain key vessels or instruments that were in the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, the table of showbread, and also the menorah. We've spoken about the tabernacle as that structure that consists of the holy place and the most holy place or the holy of holies. We've spoken about that parochia, that veil that divided these two places. And now in our study this evening, we're going to speak about the altar, and this is so important because it speaks of sacrifice. We need to remember how important it is that we do not approach God empty-handed. There is, and it's undeniable in the text, there's a relationship between worship and sacrifice, giving to God what he requires. So the altar is mentioned. And then we're going to conclude the construction of the outer court and the, the border that surrounded it and received instructions that are very insightful, that teaches us about principles of worship. And then the third section that we're going to conclude with is more information about the menorah, specifically the oil that must be used in order that the menorah is lit and provides light for the people of God. So without any additional delay, take out your Bible and let's press on. Now we're ready for the book of Exodus and chapter 27. The book of Exodus and chapter 27. We begin in verse 1 where it says, and again, God is speaking, instructing Moses, who is responsible responsible to make sure to oversee these instructions. We're giving the instructions now, but later on in a few weeks, we will see them being carried out under Moses' authority. Verse 1, And you shall make the altar. Now, I would underline that, that definite article, simply the word the. Now, there were many altars, but all the rest were pagan. Now, of course, I'm speaking about the bronze or copper altar that was outside the tabernacle, but within, as we'll see later on, the borders. It was in the courtyard of the tabernacle structure. And there was also, and we'll learn this later on in the weeks to come, an additional altar. That is the incense altar. But when we speak about the altar, the altar in a general sense, we're speaking about this bronze, this copper 
altar that was for the purpose of sacrifice. Now, we're not going to learn much about the altar and its use, but its dimension. So once more, he says, and you shall make the altar. And it shouldn't surprise us. This altar is going to be made of acacia wood, frequently used. And it's going to have a length of five cubics. And also five cubics is going to be its width. So that tells us it's a square. And likewise, if we keep reading, it says, Revua yihie ha mizbech, which means a square will be the altar and then at the end of verse one we're told its height we've already learned its length and its width its height is three cubics now this was double the height of the ark of the covenant so we see that the altar by its its dimensions is significantly bigger than the ark it's taller it is wider and it is longer than the ark the ark was as we see two and one and a half by one and a half this is larger look now if you would to verse two not only is the altar a a square but it should have horns verse two and you shall make its horns the horns of the altar upon the four corners and then we have this important phrase Mimenu, which means from it. Now, even though the altar is constructed with wood, it is going to be made into one altar. And how is that going to be done? Well, look carefully again at verse 2. You shall make its horns upon the four corners. You shall make it, and there shall be its horns. And it says, and it shall be covered. You shall cover it with copper or bronze the hebrew word is nehoshet now because it is constructed but because it's overlaid it's covered with this bronze or copper it forms one structure one complete altar and then we we learn as we continue in verse three and you shall make and these are speaking of its utensils and by the way, in our studies night in chapter 27, the word copper is going to appear 10 times. You shall make its pans. Now, the pans are for its ashes. Lay dash no. Now, this speaks about its, its remains. This same word can be spoken of as gleanings in one sense or fat. And it speaks about the residue that remains from, from the, the sacrifices, the burnt offerings that were made. And not only does it have these, these pans, but it also has its shovels, its basins, its forks, and its censers. Now, the censers are for putting out the fire. The forks are for removing the pieces of meat that were sacrificed. The basins are for the collection of blood and perhaps other liquids. And of course, the shovel is to move the residue, the ashes, and to remove them and put them in the pans. Read on the last part of verse 3. And all of the vessels, you shall make all of these vessels, these pans, these basins, these shovels, these forks, and these censers uh, for extinguishing the fire, all of these vessels you shall make from copper or bronze. Verse 4. And you shall make for it a mikbar. A mikbar, we're going to learn in the description because there's another word. The word is reshet. Reshet is a, a net. Now, in this sense, it can be, for example, if you do a barbecue outside, you'll have that place where the coals are, are stored. And above the coals, you'll have a grill, kind of a netting where the meat is placed upon. 
that holds it in place and allows the, the coals to, its heat to come up. And that's what we're talking about here. And this unique piece is called, look again at verse 4, you shall make for it a mitbar. And then it tells us, ma'asei reshet. It is a work of netting, and it's also of copper or bronze. And you shall make concerning this net four rings of copper upon the four sides. It's four sides. And this is going to be in order that you can place it securely in the right location. And the next thing we're told, look at verse 5, and you shall set it underneath the rim. This is the word karkov. And this is the rim or the border of the ark, or excuse me, the altar. And it's the, you shall set it on the rim of the altar from below. We're going to learn that the altar is made up of two halves. And it shall be a net on the, the half of the altar. So this altar is going to have two pieces. And in the middle of that, because it's three cubics high at a cubic and a half, it's going to be laid on the bottom portion as this net attached to it as a grill where the sacrifices are, are, are placed upon. Then look at what we're told. Look, if you would, to verse 6. And not surprising, just like we saw with the Ark of the Covenant and also the, the Shulchan Lechem Hapanim, the table of showbread, you shall make poles, these badims, for the altar. And the poles, in the same way, they shall be acacia wood, and you shall cover them not with gold as they were with the Ark of the Covenant or the, the table, but you once more should cover them with bronze or copper. And you shall bring its poles into these rings. Remember, they have four rings on the four corners. And you shall bring the poles into the rings that shall, shall be for the poles upon the two sides of the altar for you to be able to transport, to lift up, to carry it. So the mizbeach, and that's the Hebrew word for altar, everything, everything in the tabernacle was portable. So you had to make sure that you transported it properly with the right kavod, the right honor, the right respect for these things. Verse 8. And this altar is going to be made of acacia wood, and it says here, nevuv luchot, which means it's, it's tablets, and this could be the, the wooden material shall be ha uh, hollow. You shall make it just as was shown to you, where? Upon the mountain, thus, thus they shall do. They are the ones who's actually going to be doing the work that Moses instructs them to do. So we're given some information now about this altar that is not in the tabernacle, but outside the tabernacle, where? In the courtyard. And now we're ready for the second session or section, and we're speaking about the courtyard. Look now to verse, verse 9. And you shall make the tabernacle courtyard. Ve'asita et chatsar ha mishkan. You shall make the tabernacle courtyard. And we begin with a side. And he's going to begin with the southern side. And then we have the word klaim. Klaim? Well, we had the word yeriot. These were for the tabernacle itself. The sides of the tabernacle had what I translated the word yeriot curtains but here it's not the same word it's not curtains now from diagrams they look similar but these are the rabbis when they translate this word they talk about lace hangings now we're going to see what they're made up in a moment but they're a type of of hanging piece similar to a screen but 
There's a different word, and we'll talk about a screen again. Remember, there was a screen for the tabernacle, and there's also going to be a screen for that outer fence, that border of the courtyard that goes around entirely a large area that includes the tabernacle. This courtyard also is going to have a gate, and that gate, as we'll learn, is a screen. So we have the curtains, we have a screen, and then we have this outer fence made of claim. And uh, what do we know about it? Well, first of all, these uh, uh, lace hangings, as the rabbis called them, they are made of, they're for the courtyard, and they're sheish mazar, mashzar. That is that twisted linen that also were used for the curtains of the tabernacle. What we're told, though, is that each side, the first side, the southern side, is going to be 100 cubics in length. One side. So one side is 100. Look now to verse 10. And each side is going to be comprised of not just these hanging pieces, but also pillars. And each side is going to have 20 pillars and 20 sockets of, of copper, a bronze. Now, these sockets are going to have attached to them, and keep reading in the middle of verse 10, they are going to have uh, hooks that are placed upon these pillars, and they're going to have silver bands. So they're comprised of a pillar, on the top of the pillar is going to be these sockets, and on the sockets are going to be a hook that's going to have a band to them. Now, why is that important? These bands, if you remember, the curtains have loops. They were made of that material, techelet, that, that blue or turquoise uh, uh, fabric. And what we find here is that they are not going to have loops. They're going to have these bands. And the reason for this is that the outward is going to be more secure. Everything's secure, but it's going to be of a more uh, a substance or material that is stronger. Now, let's look at this next passage, verse 11. And thus, the northern wall. So we've talked about the northern side. It's 100 cubics. It comprises of 20 pillars. And so the, the northern wall is also going to have along its length these same claim, these same hanging pieces. And it's going to be likewise the northern side, 100 cubics. And likewise, its pillars are going to be 20 and its sockets are going to be 20, and they're going to be made of bronze or copper, and they're going to have hooks as well for their pillars, and they're going to have silver bands. Verse 12. Now, when we get to verse 12, we're speaking about not the sides, but rather, remember something, we're talking about a courtyard. It's going to have four sides, but what's important is Two of the sides, the southern side and the northern side, are 100 cubics. When we deal with the western side and then the eastern side, we're going to find that its measurements are half that. It's 50-50 on each side. So the courtyard is more of a rectangle, not a square like the altar. Look at verse 12. And the width of the courtyard on the western side, there's also these claim, these hanging uh, lace. But it should be, as I said to you, 50 cubics. And concerning their, their pillars, there's going to be 10. And concerning the sockets, there's going to be 10. Now look to verse 13. In verse 13, we are now dealing with the eastern side. And that eastern side is going to be where the entrance is, the primary entrance into the, the tabernacle courtyard. And once you enter into the courtyard, if you continue straight, you come to the mizbeach, the altar. And if you continue past the altar, which 
one could not do unless they were a Levite or a priest. You would come to the entrance of that tabernacle structure where it begins with the holy place and it goes, continues until you get to the parochia, that veil in that holy place, as we've learned, is the table of showbread and the menorah. And on the other side of the veil is the Ark of the Covenant. Now look to verse 13. And the width of the courtyard on the, the side, which is on the east, and it's Kedma, which is east, ha Mizracha. Mizracha is also the word eastward, but it also speaks of the word for the sun shines because the sun rises on the east. It should be, like we're told, just like the western side, it's 50 cubics. But look at verse 14. That eastern side is going to be unique. It's going to be different. It is going to have 15 cubics and these uh, lace hangings, these klein, and that's going to be for a shoulder, katef. So we're going to see that the eastern side, now the southern where we began, has 20 of these hanging structures. It's going to have, or excuse me, when we look, let's go back up, we're going to find that that it has uh, 20, as I, I said, it's going to have these, these structures that are hanging on them, and we find that there's going to be to be 20 of the pillars. And this is going to be one complete side, the northern side as, as well, 20 with these, these hanging things upon them. But when we get to the western one, it's also going to be smaller, 50, but of that same structure, a completeness. But when we get to, and this is significant, when we get to the eastern side, it is going to be broken into three parts. We have one shoulder and another shoulder, and in the middle, there's going to be a gate. And what we're told here, we need to get the right understanding, on one shoulder, there's going to be 15 cubics with its hangings, and it's going to have three pillars and three sockets. Likewise, it says on the other shoulder, it's going to have 15 cubics, and it's going to have these wall hangings or these side hangings of lace, and it's as well going to have three pillars and three sockets. So when we look at the eastern side, three parts, one side, which is called the shoulder, is going to have 15 cubics, three pillars, three sockets. Same thing with the other shoulder, three pillars, three sockets, and it's going to be 15 cubics in length. Now, we know if the western side is 50 cubics and we have one side or one shoulder 15 the other shoulder 15 15 and 15 is 30 there remains 20 and 20 cubics is going to be that gate and that's what we're told later on look now to verse 16 we read and for the gate of the courtyard masach masach is that word for screen that I mentioned earlier. And it's going to be, just like I said, 20 cubics. And this screen is going to be made of, just like we saw the curtains of the, the tabernacle. It is going to be made of techelet and argaman tola'at sheni sheish mashzar. Now, there's a debate because techelet, we know, is that blue or turquoise material. Then we have argaman, which is that royal purple. And then tola'at shani, which is either scarlet or crimson. So there's three. And then we have that word sheish. Sheish is a linen. And we have the phrase, if we look at it correctly, it's sheish mashzar, which most believe is a twisted or woven. 
And the question is, is this all one consisting of four parts or is it four different, different structures that's laid together? There's no way that we can be sure on this. Different scholars, different authorities have different views. But notice it says, I'm still reading in verse 16, for that screen, which is like the gate, it is Masse Rokem. It is going to have embroidery work on it. And the screen, that gate, remember, one shoulder had three pillars, and the other shoulder had three. Three and three is six. The other side had ten pillars. So will this side, the eastern side. But four of them, notice what it says. And their pillars, four, and their sockets, four. So it's going to be comprised also of ten pillars and, and ten sockets, but divided into three different sections. That's what we're told. Verse 17. And all the pillars of the courtyard around, they're going to have these, these bands of silver and hooks of silver where these screens, where these hangings are attached to. And then we're told that their sockets are, are copper. Now, when we look at the bands and the hooks, they're silver. So the bands and the hooks are silver, but everything else that's, that's made of not a fabric is copper. Now we're ready for verse 18. The length of the courtyard is 100 cubits, and the length is a 50 by 50, so it's a rectangle. And its height, this is the first time we're told this, its height is 5 cubits, and it's made of, once more, this sheish mashzar, of this twin or twisted linen, and it's its sockets are copper, verse 19. For all the vessels of the Mishkan, the tabernacle, and all of its service or its work, and all of its pegs, and all of its, its handles of the courtyard, they shall be bronze or copper. So now we see a word that we talked about last week. And these are the handles, and what they are, some Bibles say pegs or pins. And this is the bottom of the planks or the bottom of the pillars, depending upon what we're talking about. We saw that the tabernacle had planks of wood. But we see that the, the courtyard and what surrounded it, its borders, it had not uh, planks, kreshim, but Amudim pillars. But they both had these things at the bottom that were used to, to place them into a, a structure that would make them secure in the ground. And this is what we're talking about. The second word, the first time this word is used, it speaks about pegs. Now, many English translation translates these words the same, but they're different. One is the word Yitedot, yitedot. The second word is yitedot. So it's not the same. We ought not translate them the same. One has to do with these pegs. And what were the purpose of these pegs? Well, to attach the ohel. That is that tent that was over, over the, the tabernacle structure. So we have the pegs and we have these handles that were at the bottom and the tops of the planks and the pillars. And all of this, these, these pegs and these, these handles, they were, and this is the tenth time it's mentioned, they were of bronze or copper. Let's move to our third and final section in our study tonight. This concerns what most would believe is to be the menorah. Now, others have a different view, but I want to take the simplistic view. Look now to verse 20. Now, for those who are following along either in Hebrew or using a, a Bible, a Tanakh, that follows the traditions of Judaism, we're going to be getting into now a new Torah portion. 
we were in the Torah portion called Truma, which has to do with donations. And now we're in the Torah portion called Tetzaveh, which has to do with commanding, that you shall command. Look at verse 20. And you shall command, here again, God speaking to Moses, and you shall command the children of Israel. And what should they do? They shall take unto you Shemen Zayt Zak Katit. Now, when we translate that, we have to begin with the last word. And the last word is press pure olive oil. So we have these four words, Shemen Zayat Zakatit, press pure olive oil. And what is this oil for? This is for the illumination, for light that comes from the menorah. And one of the things that the rabbis spend a great deal of time speaking about is there was no olive trees in the the Midbar, the wilderness in the desert. So they had to bring this oil, or at least the, the olives with them, and make this oil in this precise way. God is very emphatic about it. Look at verse, verse 20. And you shall command the children of Israel that, that they take unto you pressed pure olive oil for light, for illumination. For kindling, this is to make the flame go up, lehealot, to kindle, and we have the phrase, ne'er to meet. Ne'er to meet is an eternal candle. Now, ne'er was, there was seven of them in the menorah. So are we talking about a different source of light apart from the menorah or are we just talking about the light that illuminated from those seven uh, places in that one menorah? Well, look, if you would, to verse 21. It says, In the tent of the meeting, outside the parochet, outside the veil, where concerning the testimony. Now, the testimony is the Ark of Testimony, the Ark of the Covenant. It was in the Holy of Holies. So this, this light is going to be outside that location in the holy place, not the most holy, not the Holy of Holies, but the holy place. And it says, And Aaron, he shall arrange, meaning he shall, shall deal with this, he shall arrange it and his sons from the evening unto the morning. Now, again, some say that we're talking about the Ner Tamid, which was a light that was always ablaze. And then we switch now to the menorah, which was ablaze from the evening until the morning. Others, and I would fall under this category, that it's talking always about the menorah. And the fact that it says Ner Tamid, meaning each and every day. There's never a day that the menorah is not lit in the evening and it's extinguished in the day, in the morning. And the Kohanim took care of this in the holy place. So that's why it's called the Ner Tamid. Now, verse, verse 21, the second part, we read, And Aaron and his son shall arrange this from the evening until the morning, before the Lord, and it's a chukat olam, an eternal statue. Now, an eternal statue means a statue, not necessarily forever, but one for this world, and it has insight for the kingdom of God, understanding kingdom truth. So we know there's many statues that God says are eternal, chukat olam, but we're not doing it today without a, a temple. It's impossible. So these things were for the world, but to teach us about kingdom truth. The word olam can be also related to the olam haba, the kingdom that is coming. And this shall be done 
throughout your generations, and this is from the children of Israel, that this is by them, that they are responsible for this. Now, some would take the position that it's because of Israel's disobedience that it's not being done each and every day because the destruction of the temple shows God's displeasure. Well, what I want us to see as we conclude is this. When we look at these structures, we see that there's a hundred. hundred has to do with completion. We see 50, which has to do with liberty or freedom, like in the year of Jubilee. We see things, for example, 10, who also has to do with, with, with completion. We see God using division where he talks about 10, dividing it 3 and 3 and 4, making 3 plus 3, 6 plus 4, 10. All these numbers have significance. And it's interesting that there's a tendency that the same numbers appear over and over in the Scripture. So when we look at these and study these things, we see there's insight in worship for God to teach his people biblical truth, kingdom truth, that we apply to our life so that we become a living tabernacle or a living temple. Because as we see in the new covenant, when, when Paul writes that we through salvation, that the spirit of God, his kinat Hashem, his glorious presence, that, that dwelt in the most holy place, the Holy of Holies. Now His Spirit dwells in us. And we become a source of, of the glory of God only when we submit and obey and we do His will. So these things from the book of Exodus, we just look at the, the outer teachings. But I hope that prepares you to ponder these things, to reread them, to make drawings of them as I have done in order to have a fuller understanding of God's revelation that he makes to his people through tabernacle and the instructions for worship that the tabernacle worship had. Well, I'll close with that. Until next week, Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.